Hello and welcome to the dungeon. I'm your host Rob and today I wanted to make a video for Dungeon Masters. We've done a bunch of player ones lately and I wanted to talk about running good sandbox adventures and campaigns and I think that a lot of times the Dungeon Masters we start out with like prepared modules and adventures that we buy and that's all well and good but at some point we kind of want to go on to like making our own things and maybe even just making our own entire game worlds and just letting players do whatever they want. So if you've been around for any length of time in the RPG sphere, you've probably heard about the conflicting types of games, the railroad versus the sandbox. And the idea of the railroad is essentially the point A, or you know, event A starts, and then that leads to B, and that leads to C, and that leads to D, which leads to the big climax of event E. And it's very linear, the players kind of have to go through everything step by step and follow the story. And that's, that's called the railroad because essentially you're like a train on your tracks and you just have to go where the tracks lead you, right? The opposite of that is the sandbox, where it's just this open world and players can pick and choose to do anything and everything they want. And I want to say up front that in a lot of circles, the railroad gets a really bad reputation and the sandbox obviously it's the opposite of that, has a really great reputation. And this isn't really true in my opinion. Uh, I don't think that running a sandbox makes your game automatically better than running a railroad. The only thing that decides what your game, whether your game is good or bad, is whether or not the players enjoy it and whether or not you enjoy running it. And you can have the most linear story ever, but if everybody's loving your game, then it's a great game. And you can have the most wide open world ever, but if your players are always frustrated and not sure what they're supposed to do and they just feel like they're spinning their heels, then it's not a good game, no matter how interesting you might think your world is or how many options you might have given them to do. So I wanted to be very clear about that up front. But, you know, I still think Sandbox is a really great play style. And to me, most really good campaigns kind of fall in between the two and have elements of both, right? So if you take a look at video games, a game like Skyrim is a great example of this. It's a very open world, especially for a video game, and there's tons of things you can do. But there's also still a main plot, you know? And I think most good games should fall into that. So I'm gonna use an analogy that I actually like better, which is the playground, because I have a three-year-old daughter and she loves going to the playground. And the playground, sure, she could choose to play in the sand, because there's lots of sand at this playground, but there's also things there set up for her in advance to interact with if she chooses. She can use the slides, she can use the swings, she can climb on stuff. There's even like some weird dinosaur puzzle thing for her to solve. You know, there's like all sorts of things for her to interact with. And then she just picks and chooses. And you know, maybe she wants to use like a little tiny slide because she's too afraid of the big slide usually. It takes her a good like half an hour to work up the courage, you know. She has to just to like level up before she can use the big slide, right? Or she'll use the corkscrew slide sometimes because it's not as scary, right? But she doesn't like the big slide right away, and that's fine. Point is, I don't try to force her to use the big slide. I just let her do what she wants. And maybe I, you know, after a while, I'm like, hey, honey, let's try to do this. And I maybe steer things a little bit, but it's still her choice. I don't force her to go on the big slide if she doesn't want to. And that's the same with your game. The idea of the sandbox is that I'm gonna provide different things for my players, and they're just gonna pick and choose what they wanna do. And I think sandboxes can be very, very rewarding, but I wanna be very clear as well for a Dungeon Master, they can also be a lot of work. It's much easier to read through somebody else's adventure that they wrote and just get an idea of what's going on and then run that for your players. And even that can be hard sometimes, because the truth is, we're not like playing Monopoly or something where you just have to go where the dice roll and the only meaningful choice you make is whether or not to buy this property or not. And by the way, the answer is almost always to buy. So, you know, even that's not a meaningful choice. Point is that even the most linear RPG game for, you know, as a tabletop game still provides a lot more choice than most of its competitors or competitors, right? So, you know, even if it's just a heavy combat game with very little role play, maybe the players decide to turn one faction against the other. Like a, a game like Dungeon of the Mad Mage, which on its surface is just a huge dungeon crawl, can still have plenty of roleplay opportunities. It does not mean 
that it's a bad game just because it's a dungeon crawl. It doesn't mean it's a bad game just because it's a very linear story. Maybe players decide to turn one faction against the other or spy on one faction or do whatever, right? The point is, the players still make those choices and so it's still much more of an open world than, you know, Monopoly or Risk or whatever, right? Um, so, I'm going to be talking later on in the video about things we can do to try to help us, though, because it is a lot of work as a Dungeon Master to run the Sandbox campaign. And I'm going to be referencing a guy named Matt Colville, who uh, has an excellent D&D channel. He has a video about running Sandbox games, and I've stolen a lot of stuff from that because, well, I've stolen a lot of specific examples from that. And then, you know, most of the stuff is, uh, you know, how I've done in the past, and taking the things that worked for me and throwing out the things that didn't work and trying to find that happy medium, right? But I also want to say that, just like my example with my daughter at the park, you kind of need to meet your players at the level they're at. I have had both players when I've been a Dungeon Master and fellow players when I've been a player in a campaign, as, you know, my other party members. Some people, they don't want to have a ton of choices. They want, you know, choice A or choice B. It's like, let me know what my choices are and then let me pick. And if you start giving them eight or ten choices, they start getting really overwhelmed and upset about it, you know? And that doesn't mean they're bad players. It just means that they kind of want some structure to their game, you know? And, you know, if you're the dungeon master and that's what your players want, you're kind of obligated to provide that for them. That's kind of part of your job, right? On the other hand, I've had players where uh, if they catch even the merest scent of a story prepared for them, they just turn around and run the other direction and start complaining that you're trying to box them in and railroad them into an adventure, whatever, right? So, you know, you kind of need to be able to analyze your players and see where you're at. And the truth is, most players fall somewhere in between those extremes, you know? But, you know, take a look at what they want and try to at least somewhat provide them the kind of game that you think they're going to enjoy. So. I've got four basic rules, and then I've got some ideas, not rules, they're guidelines, these are all suggestions, not rules. So, four suggestions, and then we're going to take a look at ways to make the work easier on ourselves. So, number one, I like to have a base of operations where my players are set up and where they can go. And I don't want to give my first adventure in that town or city or whatever, right? So, let's say, let's say the town, right? Um, so in this town of Townville, uh, I'm not gonna have my starting adventure in Townville because I want the players to get used to this idea that they're gonna go deal with whatever it is they wanted to do and then they're gonna come back. And Townville is like their place to unwind and level up and heal and all that kind of stuff, right? So base of operations, know the basic NPCs, give players, you know, give players like chances to interact with some of these people. So they, they know the people at the local bar, right? I've done this before and I've talked about this in other games where I'll have a list of like NPCs that players know going in and I'll be like, hey, you know this guy and this guy. And maybe I'll even have some like secrets that the player knows or secrets that, that guy's told them. And then that kind of helps the players to feel like they have, you know, a bit of an in with this guy because, hey, you know, this guy told you that he thinks something shady up with this guy over here. And then the player's like, ooh, Maybe I'll investigate that at some point, you know? And, you know, you're not giving away anything. You're just giving a plot hook for players to investigate. And I really like doing that kind of stuff. So that's number one. Have a base of operations and establish that kind of idea that the players are going to travel, deal with whatever, come back to the base of operations. And if at some point they decide to move and set up somewhere else, that's fine too because, you know, it's a sandbox. The players can do that kind of stuff. It's fine. Um, number two. Interesting areas to explore. So I'm going to have Townville and I'm going to have all the surrounding area, right? Maybe we have the Great Swamp to the south. Maybe we have some caves off to the east, right? And as a general guideline, anytime I create a place, I want to have at least one secret connected to that place. And I'll often do that with NPCs too. Maybe not, but, you know, if I'm going to create something, I don't want it to just be generic. I want to have something behind it. And as a dungeon master, this helps me a lot because it means I've already thought about this thing enough to have something there. So if the players decide, hey, we want to go explore the Great Swamp, 
south of the ta- south of Townville, I can be like, oh, okay, I already know there's a hag in the swamp, and she's been like, you know, searching for some sort of item or whatever, right? And now maybe the players want to kill the hag. Maybe they help the hag and try to help her recover the item. Maybe they betray the hag. Whatever. But let's just say that they decide to go to the swamp. They don't know the hag's there. And through the process of them exploring the swamp, they discover the hag. Now, now I've got some sort of idea of what's going on there. I don't have to have a whole dungeon prepared. I don't have to like make tons of stuff. Maybe they never even go to the swamp ever because they think it's just some boring swamp. In that case, all the only thing I've really done is said, hey, there's a hag in the swamp and she's looking for some sort of magic item. That didn't take me a lot of work. So if they never go there, no harm done, right? Um, on the other hand, and this is just another idea in general, you're going to have to be able to scale things up and down a lot if you're running a sandbox. Like, if our players go to the swamp at level 2, they're probably not going to be able to kill the hag, right? So if they decide they're going to fight this hag, which they might do, I need to know either A, I'm going to let the players all die because they were stupid enough to attack a hag when they were level 2, or I'm going to have to, like, give them some stuff to help them level up on the way. And I generally prefer that option, but, you know, if if my players are particularly stubborn and they're intent on suicide, then suicide by hag is probably not the worst way to go. But maybe I have some sort of ruins, right? Or I have something else there that, you know, the players can, like, do this other thing and level up. And like I said, they don't even know about the hag. So maybe this leads into them discovering the hag. And now this gives them a chance to level up. Now they find the hag. Maybe they try to fight the hag, and she just casts sleep on, like, half the party members or something, puts them all to sleep, and then tells them, like, hey, I could just kill you all, or I can make a deal with you. You can help me find this thing I'm looking for. You know, now I've got another chance for the players to go do this, and then maybe I have a dungeon or something that I prepared for that, and they, you know, go through the dungeon, recover said item, and then either give it to the hag or don't. Play your choice again, right? And then they live with the consequences of that. And maybe the players don't go to the swamp, though, until they're, like, level 12. And I'm like, ah, oh, this hag's, like, no threat to the players whatsoever. Maybe that's okay with you. Or maybe you want to level up the hag. Or maybe you want to say, you know what? Maybe it's an entire coven of hags, and they're looking for something really powerful. Like maybe they're looking for the Eye of Vecna or something, you know? And... That could be a lot more interesting. Maybe the Coven of Hags is led by some sort of like elder crone who's like this higher level hag queen, you know, and uh, I want her to be like the whole, you know, she wants this eye so she can replace the eye that, you know, she's lost and not have to share her eye with all the rest of the crones, a la, you know, Disney's Hercules. And uh, that could be an interesting campaign. And then the players give her the Eye of Vecna and now they're responsible for some elder hag having the Eye of Vecna already off to a good start so you know be aware that you might have to change some stuff or play with it a bit but just the fact that you know that there's a swamp with a hag who wants something is already a pretty good start for our purposes right um so that's interesting areas to explore number three overview of the region i want to have an idea of what like what's the religion like um are these the first people that lived here or were there people who were here before maybe this entire area once used to be part of some great yon Ti Empire. And so the dungeon in the, in the swamp that I mentioned is actually the ruins of some like yon Ti Temple from like a thousand years ago or something. That helps me to know what I'm going to like seed into that dungeon, what I'm going to populate it with. It also might help to change and shape some of the history. Like maybe this, uh, you know, the local church that worships Yig the Serpent is really just some sort of like variant on the yon Ti worshipping set or something like that. And maybe, you know, Yig, who's supposed to be the, uh, you know, this helpful serpent who, like, brings us knowledge and information, maybe there's kind of a darker side to that religion as well, you know? Something along those lines. That could be interesting. Uh, I want to know a basic history. Like I said, I want to know the government. Is Townville some, like, Wild West sovereign state, essentially, just some town that nobody else cares about and it's basically just its own thing. Or maybe Townville is part of some barony and maybe that barony is part of some kingdom and maybe that kingdom is just one kingdom in a vast empire. And so the town mayor has to answer to the baron who answers to his king who answers to the emperor. You know, I want to have a general idea of what those politics are like. Um, 
I want to have an idea of what the basic astrology is like. And this is going to be kind of an aside, which I'm going to spend more time talking about it than it probably deserves. But let's say, you know, if you look at Earth history and a lot of our, like, older civilizations would worship like the sun and the moon and stuff like that. And we, you know, ascribe different gods and goddesses to these things, right? So maybe you've got the sun and that's like the father god and the moon is his wife and that and she's like the mother goddess, right? But what if your world has six moons? Maybe there's six moon gods. Maybe you've got like one big moon and that's the mother goddess and then the five smaller moons are their children. Now I've come, got some ideas for that kind of stuff. Maybe I'm going to tie my religion into real world events. Like maybe there used to actually be a seventh moon, but that moon was struck by a giant comet. And so in my religious view of this, I have as other, as other sibling and maybe one of the other siblings was jealous of him or her and decided to murder their brother or sister. And this explains why this moon got destroyed. And maybe there was this giant meteor shower and it like struck the land and destroyed like an entire city or something. And now that's been built into the mythology where, you know, these people were like worshiping the one God and now, you know, they were all destroyed for their wickedness and, you know, he murdered his brother God or whatever. And, you know, when his blood poured onto the world, it like brought destruction everywhere it landed or whatever. And now you can build that kind of stuff into your game. And I like tying these kind of like events in because it adds like this extra level of mystery and intrigue. And maybe the players don't care. Maybe they never look into it. But as a dungeon master and as somebody who likes creating campaign worlds, it makes it more interesting for me that I've built this kind of stuff in. And it helps me to stay excited about creating my game world because there's things that I'm always thinking about like, oh, what if this was connected to this? Or, hey, I had this like meteor shower. How is that going to like tie into the world history? And how is that going to change like the religious practice of, of this one group of people or whatever, right? And just thinking about those things causes you to, you know, create different ideas and different subplots or storylines to deal with it, right? And maybe you don't even know the answer yourself, right? So like, just as a quick example, in my last game world I ran, I had this city and the legend of this city was, the players went there and they found out about this at one point. It was like pretty high level stuff at this stage. So they go to the city and they find out this city supposedly is more ancient than the world itself. And the legend is that some gods brought this city from some other world. And this city predates the creation of the world. And that when the world finally ends, this city will be the only thing that remains and it will go back to wherever it came from. Now, the truth is, I don't even know if any of that was true or not. It was just some myth or legend that I made up because I thought it sounded cool. But, that gives the players something to investigate. And just when they hear this, that already adds some interesting world building. It's not just some old city. Now there's like this whole mythology built up about it. It also creates some situations for me. Like, the people living in this city now are probably not descended from the original inhabitants. Because if they were, they might have records on this stuff. They might know that this is all just actually some giant made up myth, right? Because their records show that this clearly wasn't the case. Or maybe their records don't because somebody like destroyed it. Maybe some religion who first started this leg legend destroyed all the old records that showed that this city was just a really old city. Maybe that's not what happened. Maybe that is really what happened is some other group of gods brought this city here and that this is the actual legend that, and is based on like true re revealed like, you know, lore from the gods or whatever, right? Either way, it already makes this city a lot more interesting. And at the very least, I know that this city is going to be incredibly ancient, whether that legend is true or not. Because if it was, you know, a couple hundred years old, nobody's going to believe this story, right? And it's going to be like false, of, or verifi verifiably false is what I'm trying to say, sorry. Um, so that's a quick example, right? Another great example would be like from uh, Game of Thrones, you right, Song of Ice and Fire. I reference that a lot because it's great world building. But the Dothraki have this legend about the ghost grass. And the ghost grass basically is just a super, super tall grass and it just chokes out all the plant life so nothing else can really grow there once the, grow gr the, the ghost grass has infested the area. But the Dothraki have this view that Eventually, the ghost grass is going to spread and cover the entire planet, and that's when the world will die because nothing else will be capable of living there. 
And to me, that's just interesting world building. And I'd love to try to seed something like that into a game and then have a situation where players have to walk through the ghost grass. Because even if that's just completely made up BS, it's just, the truth is it's just this grass that goes really high and it's like this voracious weed that sucks up all the nutrients and nothing else can grow there. Your players are probably not gonna be super thrilled about wading through grass taller than them for the first time ever, you know? So, uh, you know, that kind of stuff makes things interesting. And it gives the players things to explore, right? And that's, that's really what sandboxing is all about. You want the players to be able to explore the world and interact with things. Um, another thing that I like to do is maybe have competing histories. Like let's say back in my ancient past, the elves and dwarves had some giant war. And now they're at peace, but they still don't really like each other, right? But what caused the war? And more importantly, why do the elves think the war happened? And why do the dwarves think the war happened? Because almost guaranteed, they're going to have conflicting views on what caused this. And, you know, maybe you know the truth, maybe you don't. Maybe the truth, like most things, is somewhere in the middle, right? But the dwarves have their view of the history, the elves have their view of the history. And maybe there's some poor human barbarian guys who got caught in the middle of all this, and they have their view of the history, you know? And nothing wrong with having more than one view. Nothing wrong with having more than one, like, view of, like, religion and stuff as well, right? Like, maybe one religion thinks that the world happened in this way, and another one thinks it happened in their way, right? That happened in Earth history all the time, you know? If you look at, like, you know, how the Aztecs think the world was created versus, you know, the, the Norse Vikings. They both have their completely different views of how the Earth came to be. And even if your worlds overlap and you have Vikings and Aztec-type stand-ins both in your world simultaneously, it doesn't mean that they've come up to some, you know, agreement on what the truth is. And you have a world where actual gods and goddesses could exist so who's to say that either one of them are even right? You know? Well, maybe the truth is they're both right, but they just don't see it because the story is being told from two different points of view. Either way, you have an overview of the, re of the region. Uh, so number four, have some initial adventure sites. And these are usually, for me, these are gonna be plot hooks. They're gonna take the players to different things I want them to explore, right? So like I said, if I create an area, have a secret for that area, and maybe the players know the secret or find out about the secret or a rumor. A lot of old, like, first edition type Dungeons and Dragons adventures, they'd have, like, rumor tables. And each player could learn, like, one rumor in town or whatever, right? And you'd roll on the table and maybe it's true, maybe it's false, maybe it's a bit of both. But these rumors were kind of plot hooks to help the players explore different things, right? I like to do that kind of thing. So now I'm going to get into the Matt Colville stuff, which was a great idea and something that I think is excellent for really helping you to streamline things because like I said running a sandbox game is a lot of work as a dungeon master a lot more work than just running a prepared module right so what he likes to do is he likes to kind of kind of combine both he'll steal a bunch of low-level modules and use those as his initial adventure seeds right so to use some of the examples that he used in his actual video right Let's say he has, against the cult of the reptile gods, the keep on the borderlands, and the crucible of Freya, which were three of the adventures he named. So in against the cult of the reptile gods, the characters investigate this cult, there's a bunch of people in town who go missing, and they're all getting maybe replaced, I don't, you know, I'm not even sure, or maybe there's a brainwash, but they go missing, and then they come back days or even weeks later, and they just don't quite seem right, you know? And it has this kind of invasion of the body snatchers type of feel, right? And it's a cool adventure with lots of like investigation type stuff, right? Then you've got the Crucible of Freya, in which uh, this town gets attacked, a religious artifact from the town is stolen, and is taken by this like group of orcs, right? And if you have, if your party has a paladin or a cleric or anybody who might be tied to this uh, zealot barbarian, for example, right? Then maybe you just change it from Freya to whatever religion your players are from, and now they have a reason to go do this and try to recover this religious artifact for, for their church, right? And then you've got Caves of Chaos. So what Matt Colville likes to do is he'll come up with different uh, like plot hooks to take the players in different places, right? So with Adventure Against, against the Cult of the Reptile Gods, let's say 
that one of your players has a sister, and your sister just happens to be in this town, which I think was called Olay. Olay's or Elaine, something like that, right? So your player gets a letter from his sister saying like, hey, I'm really worried, like weird stuff's happening in the town, and like she starts naming some of the people that maybe he grew up with, and you know, I don't know if you remember Thad, the butcher's son, but he went missing for like three weeks, and now he's back, but he just doesn't seem normal, and he's acting really weird, and when you try to talk to him, he doesn't really like respond properly, and you know, blah, 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 right? And now your player might have a reason to go to this town and investigate the cult. Meanwhile, one of your other players, maybe his best friend, is uh, a guard with a merchant caravan. And one of the other guards from the caravan, or one of the merchants or whatever, comes running in the town all covered in like mud and blood and telling you that the caravan was attacked by a bunch of like skeletons and zombies. And the last thing he saw was your friend being carried off, still alive and still trying to fight by these undead into some sort of cave complex that he saw. And now the players can investigate the Caves of Chaos. And maybe the last one is, you've got, like I said, a paladin who, you know, because they want to help their church, wants to recover this artifact or a cleric or whatever, right? Paladin is a technology tied to O's these days, not really a religion still, but whatever. Point is, easy enough for you to like just change things around and reskin it, right? And now your players have all these different choices and they can choose which one they want to do in what order. They can choose to do none of them. And they could, you know, because you also got there's some sort of like weird uh, tower that, you know, used to be like a guard tower that like protected the outlying farms. But like 10 years ago, it was overrun by orcs and the play thing got like half destroyed. And now there's like a bunch of bandits that live there. Now they use it as a base of operations to raid a lot of the farms, right? And maybe your players have no other reason to go there except for just to like, hey, we want to just go kill some bandits. Like, we don't really care about your friends, sorry. Like, that's kind of a you problem, not really an us problem, you know? Oh, church stuff? Yeah, that's, that's not really an us problem either. Your sister? Man, I don't even know your sister. Like, come on, let's, let's go here. You know, whatever. Now your players have a bunch of different things. They get to pick what they want to do. Maybe you bounce around the order. Like I said, maybe you scale things up as they level up. So, that, you know, the goblins or whatever are now a bunch of goblins that work, work for a bunch of orcs or whatever, right? Whoever you want to do it, you have these different adventures and you just seed them in. And now you don't have to prepare like 20 different things for the players to run through. You just run whatever adventures the players have chosen. And if they don't choose, choose any of them, then you have, you know, that's where you have some other stuff that you want to make up yourself or that you want to run. Or you can use any of these like books you find, like Dungeon Delve, I think was one back in like third edition. And uh, Cobalt Press has one for fifth edition, I remember. But basically just like, like these books of like short three to five room dungeon. And you know, it's just an encounter. And you can see those kind of things into your adventures. And you know, players go do it. You just like, hey, that might fit in really well with this. And you just plug it in there. And, you know, that kind of stuff's really fun. So, that's the basic overview there. Uh, the one thing I want to mention, though, that Matt Kova also talked about, which I think is an excellent idea, is that he also likes to have some sort of, like, main plot brewing in the background. And this is kind of what I talked about with my Making Great NPCs video. I don't know if you've watched the video or not, but one of the things I talked about was that I like to sometimes layer in the like one of the main villains or even the main villain. So I used an example. I had this demon queen named Bellatrax. And one of the players met Bellatrax when she was level... Like the player was level one and she met this like CR 26 or 27 demon queen. But she didn't know it was a demon queen. And the demon queen had no interest in killing the player because... You know, she was like masquerading as like this lowly acolyte in this temple. You know, she was trying to like seduce the high priest in order to like corrupt him and turn him to evil. Because that's the kind of thing she liked to do. You know, she's not like a burn the city down, destroy it. She's like a corrupt everybody in the city and let them burn their own city down and enjoy it while it happens. You know, that was kind of her M.O. So she had no reason to kill just some random person in a temple. She wasn't, she wasn't about to do that, you know, and... Uh, so, but the fact is the player met her and then later they met like 
like they saw like different images of her and different aspects of her. They actually actually met her later on when they were like level twelve or thirteen, and she was masquerading as some sort of vampire because she could like change shape and just take whatever form she wanted, right? And uh, you know, so they actually met her a few different times, and then when they finally had the big battle with her, you know, they kind of see her in the one guys and they're like, "What? What are you doing here?" You know, and she's like. Oh, you haven't figured it out yet. And then she just starts changing shape. And they start realizing that they've met her all these other times. And all along, it's just been the same person, like, kind of steering and manipulating things behind the scenes. And it made for this great battle because the players realize, like, oh, man, like, we've known this chick forever, you know? And, like, different times when people screwed us over, it turned out it was her. And different times when people helped us, it turned out that was her because she wanted us to do something for her or whatever, right? And so it turned out there was all these connections, this little, like, interwoven thread, so the entire thing. So what Matt likes to do is he'll have those, you know, adventure seeds that the players can do. He's got the thing with the sister. He's got the buddy who got captured in the Caves of Chaos. He's got the religious artifact that got stolen. But meanwhile, in the background, there's some other threat. So maybe you have this, uh, oh, I already used the necromancer. Maybe you have a barbarian lord, and he's gathering all these tribes. Or this orc war chief, and he's defeated a bunch of the other, uh, other orc tribes, and now he's uniting them all under his banner, and he's marching down, and your poor little town of Townville is between him and the enemy army. And so while your players are doing all this other stuff, they've heard about this army of orcs, and the conflict between the orcs, and maybe as things go on, they find out that, oh, look, sounds like this one orc war chief has, like, defeated all the other tribes, and now he's, like, uniting them, and the player's like, oh, well, that sucks. Well, you know, we've got to help my sister, so, you know, wh whatever, right? And then, you know, they finish all that stuff, they come back, and now they find out that there's this huge army of orcs on the march, and they're only, you know, a day or a few days away from the town, and now they have to try to, like, prepare the town's defenses and they have to like muster the forces and maybe they have to try to build some sort of like moat around the town and some sort of like crude walls and barricades and stuff and then like they have to try to do the fighting and maybe they have to like hold out because the Baron is sending his army and the town now has to like survive like for you know 24 hours or whatever 48 hours against overwhelming odds so that the Baron and his army can arrive. And now the players are in charge of like trying to lead this defense of the town. And meanwhile, this whole thing's been building in the background. The players just, you know, didn't deal with it because they were too busy doing all the other stuff. And I really like that aspect. And you can even play it on any of those different ways. Maybe the players decide to go deal with the orc army, but they didn't go help your buddy who got stolen and hauled off into the caves. And now the necromancer lord from the Caves of Chaos has managed to uh, sacrifice enough people to build his undead army to the point where he's able to attack the town and now you have to hold off the undead army long enough for the Baron and his forces to get there to save the town. You know what I'm saying? Like, no matter how you want to do it, you can like let the players pick and choose whatever they want to do while still fitting in kind of like the story that you want to tell and you're not forcing the players down any specific path. You're letting them you know, pick and choose, and then just dealing with the consequences and the fallout of it. And this leads me to my final point, and by, by far the most important thing in any campaign, not just a sandbox campaign, which is choice and consequence. I don't care if the players are doing a dungeon, I don't care if it's the most open world ever, it doesn't matter. I want the players to be able to make their own choices, and then I have to decide what the consequences of those choices are going to be, you know? And maybe those consequences aren't good. Maybe your players are a bunch of murder hobos and they, you know, decide to kill a bunch of people in town. And they just keep doing this from town after town after town. And because they're getting to be high level adventurers and they're killing a bunch of level zero and level one town folk, it's not a really big deal. But maybe it becomes a big deal. Because somebody ends up finally going to the Baron, and the Baron sends word to the King that, hey, the reason I wasn't able to pay your taxes is because somebody's been murdering all my citizens, and I kind of need help dealing with them. Apparently it's just some random band of adventurers that just keep killing people. And now, your players end up getting hunted by some appropriate challenge type of group that's uh, much higher level. Or maybe they're just like way higher level. 
and they just stomp the players under the ground because you just wanted to pay them back for killing all the NPCs in your campaign. I'm not saying you should do that. I'm just saying, you know, choices and consequences, right? So, uh, in in any situation where the players are making a choice, I always want to think, what are going to be the results of this? And maybe those are only good results, right? Like maybe they manage to. Uh, save the kidnapped elven princess and show that it was really the evil wizard guy who took her, not the elf, or not the dwarves, sorry. And so you avert the second great elf dwarf war by, you know, returning the princess and showing that the dwarves weren't responsible and, you know, everything gets kind of calmed down, your players get to role play through a bunch of stuff. And they stopped a giant massive war. That's a good thing. Maybe there's no harmful consequences for that. But there's probably rewards, right? The elves are probably grateful they got the princess back. If nothing else, the dwarves might, you know, be uh, like a little upset that they got blamed by the elves. But, you know, they might be glad that they didn't have to fight the elves again. Who knows? Point is, players made choices, players did stuff. There's consequences to the things that the players did. And in any game, choice and consequence is really, like to me, that's why we're playing a role-playing game. All right, that is really the heart of what makes this a role-playing game as opposed to like Monopoly or whatever else that we could be doing instead, right? And even like, I play Gloomhaven sometimes with my buddies. That's kind of like what we do while I'm preparing my next game. So we spent the last couple of months playing Gloomhaven while I prepared our current campaign that we just started this week, right? In fact, that would be a good series of videos at some point. I might kind of just do like, this is how I kind of prepare my own campaign world type stuff. Who knows? It might be boring though, so I don't know. Maybe it won't be a good series of videos, but I'll think about that in the future. But anyways, that's kind of what we do. And I like Gloomhaven. It's a really fun game, but it's not really a role-playing game. And at the end of the day, as much fun as it is, and as much as you can level up and make choices for what cards to put into your deck and stuff, and it really captures a lot of like the feeling of you know tabletop role-playing in some ways, but it's still a board game with very linear set of rules and win conditions. And generally there ends up being, you know, a best way to play that character, not good ways to play that character. And that's not to rip on Gloomhaven. I love Gloomhaven. I'm just finna saying it's a great game, but you know, it's also not a role play game. And I think that the fact that you make meaningful choices and the players make meaningful choices and that those choices then shape the campaign world is really what a role-playing game is all about. So I think that's probably a good place to end the video. I've probably rattled on way too long as it is. I'll try to remember to put a link to Matt Colville's video in my description. But yeah, I think that's everything. So feel free to like, subscribe, all that kind of stuff, and I will see you in the comment section.